You know when people talk about things being federated, like federated identity, federated data governance, all that kind of thing. Now, if you work directly with those systems, you know what that means. If you don't, you might kind of be wondering precisely what is being federated. Well, I've got Peter Corliss back on the show today. Peter and I spoke recently about how words like ecosystem and stack might not be the most helpful terms going forward. And in that vein, we talk about the idea of federated data. Let's jump in. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real-Time Analytics Podcast. I am your host, Tim Berglund, and I'm joined again by returning guest, Peter Corliss. Peter runs product marketing at StarTree. Peter, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. It was a great first session we had. You want to give us a recap? Yeah, let's recap. And I was going to say, I always love it when a guest returns. I think of it as the triumph of hope over experience. But <laughs> um, yeah. I, I want to try to recap it if I could. I want to, I want to, I want to, I'll do that. And you tell me if I got it right. I mean, mm -hmm. I was there, so hopefully I did, but you were talking about your notion of the, uh, you know, the modern data stack and kind of the, the trouble with that idea that there is one. Um, and we were talking about the limitations of the ecosystem analogy as if we're cultivating organic things that that grow on their own and not carefully designing you know elaborate machines is that about right yeah exactly and the, the going back also into the history of like the stack came out of when your your website your entire company could be running out of a 1u in a rack right that you had everything from the operating system the database the web server application was all running in that one system Right. And we've come a long way from them. Uh, we now are running what I call clusters of clusters or systems of systems. Right. Each one of them could be fleets of thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes individually. And then these m monstrous aircraft carriers scale systems all interconnect in some gigantic Uber topology. Right. Of course, if you were small enough to operate your whole business on a one U server, and you're that small or nearly that small today, you've probably got 20 containers that mm -hmm. are doing that work. Now, they may, depending upon how virtualization and everything, blah, 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 may still be running on the equivalent of that one you exactly computed storage, but it's not, it's in terms of processes and that, that topology, uh, we have a much more uh, much more complex system. Yeah, and if you are running a small business these days, you're probably not doing all self-hosted infrastructure. You're no. probably relying upon a lot of microservices. If you're doing payment processing, you're probably outsourcing that. You're not running your own payment processing engine. You're probably... No, yeah, it's all SaaS components that you've assembled. Exactly. And so there's, and there's this cloud of APIs around whatever you're running as well, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's, there's an idea that I'm preoccupied with that I want, uh, I want to ask you to explore today. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you know, you'd made the case that, that there really is no modern data stack. And in terms of the application stack or the set of tools that we typically relied on, a database, a web framework, a front end thing, a, a language, you know, to build a monolith, it was, there were choices, but, but they were pretty contained and you sort of knew what they were. That world is gone. Right. Um, there is a new application development environment. Uh, you know, maybe stack's the wrong word, but we we just don't know. We're using a language and there's events at the bottom somewhere mm -hmm. uh, in, in topics. And like, we don't know what's going on in the middle. And part of the, the purpose of this podcast is to explore that middle. And, right. and real-time analytics is one of the things that we do in there now. So in the spirit of exploring that new space, uh, you've got some interesting ideas about federation. And I think, I'm trying to remember on our last episode, did we kind of start to hint at federation? Yes. Maybe we yeah. did. Okay. We, so we yeah, did. We, yeah, we talked about the whole concept. Like, uh, again, I'm a Star Trek fan, yes. and I love the concept of a federation, right? And in the federation, you have Klingons and humans and Vulcans and Andorians. They're all these different species, right? This is a heterogeneous Federation. This is not all one people. There's multiple species, um, and they're all working towards some common goal or purpose. And yes. that, to me, is what we can use as an analogy for modern federated data system architectures. There you go. 
So um, give us an example of, uh, let's get, federated data is complicated, but um, we, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about federated identity, yeah. um, which isn't really data, but I think it's an easier thing to see. So, Right. So a long time ago when I, when I was working at a distant company, um, there was a project that I once had where we had to identify the people and organizations of, of the corporation. Then underneath them, the functions that they needed to perform. Underneath that, the data systems upon which they had to perform it. And then the organizations that supported those systems, which was a completely different thing. Like the users and the administrators were a different mapping. Okay. Right? But you had to go through all those different layers to kind of understand like, okay, so here's the people trying to get stuff done. And and how do they plow through all the policies and processes and, you know, eventually you get to like the screens and places they needed to do their work. And then what are the systems that run them? And then how do those systems then pump data between each other? There might have been a, a, a manufacturing organization that needed to get a software license key. And that was the software license key generator is run by engineering, manufacturing's running the, you know, that, uh, the, 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 the line. And then, of course, customer service needs to understand where this order is during delivery, right? During the whole building and manufacturing and burn-in process. So you have different entities that all need to track this thing through a major uh, corporation. And so if you think about this right now, um, manufacturing has systems that they might run and they have their users and then you'd have engineering and they have their users and these are in totally disparate systems. So, but that one employee should have a universal identifier, regardless of the systems they need to operate upon within the corporation. And, and the disparate systems, they're separate business units, separate management chains, budgets, everything. They're going to build their own stuff. They're, they're going to have their own little standing army. Oh, of, of course. I mean, engineering people. is going to beat, uh, you know, customer service away with a stick. Like you're not, you're, you know, like to actually get access to it was a certain level of trust. Right. right. But, you know, to then say, ask for like features or changes on it. No, I mean, they're running their own systems. Right. right. And right. I think that this is not atypical at very large organizations where you have separate business units, maybe even an acquisition that's brought in their own systems. Right. Yeah. It's hard to get consensus among big groups like this. And so you kind of give them little limited pockets of sovereignty. It, uh, it sounds like this could be a discussion taking right. place in Philadelphia in 1776. Um, so yeah. just, just yeah. a single sign-on problem is a huge one, right? Right. right? And then, for instance, if you take a look at – so now let's back up and take a look at some of the standards around this. You take a look at OAuth, and that became a point of debate for a decade with the problems that they had with OAuth 1.0 and eventually the things that they put into OAuth 2.0 and even now they're putting up like caveats and things not to do like best practices, how not to shoot yourself in the foot with OAuth 2.0. <laughs> so when you have a standard, it also becomes a great risk to an entity. You know, and a lot of people retrenched from that and said, you know what, we're not going to do this single sign on thing. You know, it harmed us. So I think that that's one of the things that I want to put forward as a caveat is like we would love to see you know, the equivalent of the Federation, right? We'd love to see this perfect nirvana that Gene Roddenberry saw, right? This, right. you know, all, all these people working together, uh, et cetera. But it's a messy, messy thing in real life to try and get, you know, consensus within an organization, which is why, like, even in data mesh conversations, there's this huge dichotomy between the people who want to run independently right? The, 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 the uh, local ownership, as it were, and the people still pushing for the enterprise management, right? And so the, the, the concept of federation in, the, uh, in federated data governance came out of that, where you try and meet the needs of both of those, yeah. right? Some centralized control, but local ownership. Now, we'll uh, back you up a step. I want to finish up on identity before, because I, I, federated data governance is is kind of the thing that touches most directly on what we do and, and most matters of interest to this podcast. Yeah. But the federated identity, I mean, you've got, say, 
you gave the example of a large company with different business units who are operating semi-autonomously with kind of limited little bits of sovereignty. And you could also have just whole separate companies. Correct. That are completely sovereign in terms of their own governance and, and development and all that. Right. And OAuth uh, was and is, I think, in its current incarnation, it's it's remarkably more successful than than 10 years ago. I mean, right. it's, Oh, it's come a long I'm, way. <laughs> I'm starting to feel a little old fashioned when I have one password create a password for a new site I'm registering with. Uh, right. it's, it's it's to that point now where they're like, you know, you should probably just sign in with Google or Apple or something. Um, yeah, and and I'm 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 starting to feel like like the old guy who still gives directions to how to get to his house instead of just an address, you know. Um, so I think OAuth is is becoming a success, but the whole idea there was that here's this common API, I call it, set of interactions that will bring together, you know, uh, some set of identity providers and do the authentication authorization stuff that you really want done, but it isn't, it's, it's, it's a set of interactions, um, let's call it APIs, mm -hmm. uh, it's not central database of identities. It's no. explicitly saying, we don't want to be that. No. We want to be the system of rules by which <laughs> that stuff gets done and other people do those things. And that's Google and that's Apple. And that's. And that's I think that's, a, that's a fantastic provider. point is that, yeah. um, you know, we're trying to avoid the issue of all the eggs in one basket, right? Because as soon as somebody hacks that central server, you know, it was the active directory problem. Like once somebody gets the keys to the system, they're in everything, yeah. right? So, so I think that we're coming a long way in that regard. Um, but, but that's, and that's just the human users, right? And their mm -hmm. access and authentication. But then for instance, let's go from OAuth. What OAuth doesn't tell you is what tables am I allowed to see in the database? <laughs> right, right. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's up to you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so there needs to be like, for instance, our back doesn't have the same level of RFCs, doesn't have like our back is all done independently by every single vendor in the world. Our back is a set of features that computer programs have that people give to them so that people with roles can have things that they do. I mean, that's it's it's a yeah, there's there's nothing standard about our back. No, no. And in fact, I think mm -hmm. I took a look at this and, and that's, anyway, by the way, for anybody who's new to the concept, that's role based access control. Yes. Uh, that's one of those acronyms that people use and never define and just expect you to know. Exactly. Wow. And what's really interesting about that is that um, ANSI uh, and NAST tried to hand um, RBAC as a standard over to a group called INCITS. And they actually had it back in 2012. They tried to make a standard around that. ANSI did? Yes. Okay. America number one here. Right? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm like, that's a little imperialist. And I, you know, all right. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I hate it. Um, I, I feel like I should, but it apparently didn't work. No, because it was withdrawn in 2019. Okay. Right? So so that's a concept where somebody took their Bunsen burner and ran down to the Pacific and tried to boil the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so bring this to – I guess you I guess you are if you're talking about our back. <laughs> bring this to federated data governance right uh, now because that's that's a – uh, certainly a hot topic. It's one of the pillars of data mesh. Um, and with, I think federated identity is very easy to understand, but how does it? Yeah. So, so if you take a look at a lot of, let's say in data meshes, uh, a lot of the standards around, let's say a data product are focused around, like, basically this is a table or this is files in a file system, right? It's very focused these days still upon discrete data products. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is, I mean, there's a practicality to that, right? There's, and, and by the way, very briefly, if you don't know what data mesh is, we're not going to necessarily explain it on this podcast. We'll put a link up. Um, but a, a, a data product is, if you can imagine there's some application doing something um, and you might want to be able to, in the analytics sense, understand what that application has been doing. That application doesn't just expose its transactional database and say, why don't you ETL this? And I hope you like it but it intentionally designs and produces and releases some stream of, of little reports on what it's doing. So like, here's this transactional data and here's, you know, I don't know, think of it as a Kafka topic or a Pinot table or something. Here are these other little 
things I'm releasing that are telling you what I'm doing. So that's 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 data product. It's it's like the analytics output stream right. exhaust gas of of an application or a service. That was much too long. I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. I mean, I think this is important context because I mean, data mesh. There's been whole books written on this. There, I have watched tons of videos. You know, just just to wrap my head around what people really mean. And unfortunately, unlike like a W3C standard that you can just read or, uh, you know, an IETF RFC that you can just read, there's not really a technical definition of what a data mesh is or isn't really. There's concepts behind it, like things should be discoverable and addressable. Um, but what is the method of discovery? It, there's a lot of different independent vendors that have their own belief on how data discovery of data products should work. But there's yeah. not really the same level of standardization. There's not really a strong um, uh, standard. Now, there are some attempts at this, like DCAT from the W3C, which is Data Catalog. Um, and those projects, like W3C's uh, DCAT, that's come up in the last decade or so. And like the U.S. government, U.K. government, they've committed to it in a couple of places. And you can actually find some DCAT glossaries out there for various data products that and the D government cat with a T as in DCAT. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We will also link to that in the show notes. Yeah. And I, I, I want to say on the point of data mesh being not nailed down as a standard um, and, and being hard to understand, we'll link to a previous keynote by uh, Jean-Marc Degani on, on data mesh, where I think she actually you know, she's the originator of the idea. There's a lot of people who talk about it. It wasn't until I heard her actually give a talk on it that I felt like, okay, I understand this. So she's right. pretty good at articulating it. And I know I'll just, she hasn't been a guest on the podcast yet, um, but she's a, a great communicator and a good friend. And I, I think I can speak for her in saying that in as much as she is the steward of the idea as its creator, she's always been careful when I've talked to her to not want to turn it into implementation specific details. Like it's, it's this kind of brave, new, bold idea and framework. And I feel like she's trying to keep us from turning it into a schema on a Kafka topic, which is what I want to do. Right. Right. I'm like, how do you build it? How do I help people build this thing? And she's like, no, like, get the ideas in your head first and just stop doing that. And then, then people can go implement it. So I'm with you on that. We'll put some links up that hopefully we'll, we'll clarify. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so again, uh, there is this di this dichotomy of people wanting to conceptually wrap their head around it. But then when you ask your engineering team, your platform team, like, okay, now we're going to do data governance or whatever it is, or we're going to do a data catalog. They go like, okay, how? Right. And, and so you need to be able to actualize the philosophy. Right. Uh, so again, I think that efforts like DCAT, maybe the beginnings of this. Um, I think they got started on this in about 2014. And so it's been percolating over the past decade or so. Uh, the latest draft DCAT version three came out in uh, March of 2023. And it's an interesting read uh, because what they're trying to do is um, be able to catalog um, both data products and data services, right? And these days, a data product, like I said, very batch oriented, very much like here's files in a file system, here's a web page for report. But when you get into data services, now you start saying like, okay, well, maybe maybe that might be a grammar that we can use for, let's say, an event streaming system. Because it's constantly being updated. It's not a static thing, right? And uh, there can always be like what happens when you add a new uh, Kafka stream. Right. Yeah. That that should be it should be its own data product, right? But maybe there's products within that, like sub products, right? One group might filter out for one uh, uh, element of the data stream. Another group might be interested in a very completely different thing from the data stream, right? It's all the same Kafka topic, but different slices that are coming off of it. So I think that we're just the the standards are just catching up with the world of event streaming. Right. Gotcha. And I think that that's the thing is that we have this high pressure gas pipe that's just racing along with event streaming. Right. Which is very different than, uh, you know, getting a barrel of oil delivered to the back of your loading dock. <laughs> <laughs> I 
vary because, uh, I, I mean, there's always, you know, you talk to a petroleum engineer, they'll tell you about all kinds of innovation that's happening in their field and, and, and shipping and all kinds you know, everything in such supply shipping chain. Shipping and handling and is all the difference, right? Yeah. You kind of, you kind we kind of know how that works. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's stuff comes out of the ground and you put it in a pipe and then you bring it to this thing and you boil it and then you, you know, right. It's, it's all, um. That's that's more settled science than what's happening in our world right now. So, but right. but if you were to um, really summarize uh, federated data governance, kind of come back to that and yeah, nail that down like we did for ID. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. What what is it? So there was um, it's kind of like. Uh, uh, some uh, there was a bunch of different principles. There's like data quality standards, uh, data integration standards, uh, data compliance standards, lifecycle management standards. Like so, data governance actually comprises a bunch of different subcomponents to it. Metadata management and glossaries, right? So beyond your data products, you also have the the glossaries of them and catalogs and stuff. So there's there's a whole bunch of other things. And again, all of these are more philosophical, and they start moving from the computing systems up towards your team and how, how you manage these things, right? So it starts getting to things like policies and procedures, right? Like it's, so it leaves the API, the, the engineer can often feel lost in this world, right? Because you start talking about like, you know, data management teams and stuff like that. And he's like, I really just want to code. <laughs> <laughs> but like data integration standards, you, there's, there's, that's not something you're going to solve at the API level. Uh, uh, <laughs> nor perhaps ever. Um, right. I wonder, let me, let me ask a question a different way. And this, this is a, this is a, uh, this is terrible host behavior. Um, cause it's, it's, a, I think it's a hard question, but you're a product marketer. Yeah. If you're starting a company that is, that is making a federated data governance product. Mm. What is your message? Like what is the pain that you're solving and what is it that you do? Well, okay. So first of all, let's, I'm going to talk say through that, that because that's a lot. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, first of all, there are some incredibly talented people that I've been watching their videos, right? So I, I can't presume to speak on their behalf. Um, but from what I've been seeing, there's a couple of things. First of all, the a lot of the vendors themselves are trying to do what I think is a disservice to their customers by trying to make it seem as if their one product will solve all, be all, end all, like a, a panacea. It's a snake oil, right? This is this is the old uh, um, uh, digital um, uh, snake oil salesman, right? And I think that the problem with that is no one product is going to solve for this. I think okay. that uh, in order to do data governance right, you probably want to have a, a more open platform that will integrate with, first of all, whatever the customer is existing and already using, right? Because trying to move everything that ex exists into your panacea data governance platform is not going to happen. <laughs> That's like, right. it's just not going to happen. So you probably have to deal with um, the reality of inertia. Yes. Where things already are is where they're going to exist unless or until you pro you provide some reason for people to move into your system. Right. And that's usually because something hurts. For example. Yes. Back to the simpler example of federated identity. Oh. <laughs> building auth sucks. Yes. Keeping passwords is scary. Correct. Even hashed, salted, whatever, do your, th you know. Maintaining identities in your data infrastructure is scary and building auth sucks. So those are like very, very understandable pains. Now, frankly, right. implementing OAuth is, is not exactly a, a cakewalk, but it's, it's uh, you know, and so whatever the federated data governance future is could also involve now I have to adapt my data product publication thing to some mm -hmm, API mm -hmm. layer or whatever. But you know, the, the, the pain is that it's just hard to do on your own. So I think any successful data governance products, and I'm seeing a, a good number of them, are taking a look at the systems that you're already using and trying to build bridges between them, as opposed to trying to capture 
people and say like, the, you know, the first thing you need to do is migrate everything you're doing into our system <laughs> and that'll solve all problems. It's like that, that, that to me sounds like a two year re-engineering task at a major organization. And by the time mm-hmm. you're done with it, your boss is firing you because you haven't met your ROI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, you you can sell ambitious chunks of new data infrastructure. I mean, I've kind of been in that world for Fair enough. some years. It's just that that's, that's like a big lifestyle change Correct. that you're asking people to make. And they, they have a, a, you know, very like, you know, real time happened to the world. Uh, and that's, you could read about it in the in-flight magazine. It's big enough. So, okay, I have to rebuild all my stuff. But, you know, let me add this new layer that simplifies some things. You don't want to. Yeah, Ask you to and, and that's a high risk kind of thing. So as a product yeah. marketer, the thing I'd be worried about is even if I could get somebody to sign up for my first year of service, will they just cancel after uh, the end of that year? Right, right, right. So whatever I would be doing, I'd be looking to make quick inroads on some key pieces of pain and then finding that niche that we can ecologically survive around and then building out from it as opposed to trying to capture an entity and make them all change everything just because we have a new solution that we want you to be paying for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's well, hey, there's there's a lot more in this. I'm gonna say new stack. I know you don't like stack, and I completely accept <laughs> by the way, I'm saying stack while accepting all your criticisms of that word and of the ecosystem stuff. I'm gonna keep saying ecosystem. And there's a, right? this little angry Peter head on my shoulder saying that's the wrong word. And I and you're right. But by shorthand, these are important aspects of the new territory we're exploring, and it's been fun to talk through this with you, and I know there's, you got more in this list, so we'll, we'll keep talking through this new, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and again, don't worry about me be, being angry. I'm on a kind of a rant about stack being insufficient and ecosystem being weak, but I know that this is the grammar we have. And just like I talked about moving to like whatever the, the new model is going to be, if these are the words we have to use to intercommunicate, so be it. I'm just hoping that in the next decade, we develop a whole new grammar. My guest today has been Peter Corliss. Peter, thanks for being a part of the Real Time Analytics Podcast. Thank you so much. And there you have it. If you feel compelled to help us spread the word and grow the Real Time Analytics community, You can give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever fine podcasts are sold. If you're watching us on YouTube, hey, subscribe and of course, hit that notification bell. And you can always share your favorite episodes on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever it is you do social media. Thanks, and I look forward to talking to you in the next episode.